excited about this turnout. This was really fantastic. And I know there are people in this room who have a whole wide variety of opinions on this subject and those who have not formed an opinion yet. So we hope this will be an informative and dynamic dialogue for all of us. So I'm Kaylin Rich. I'm the local chapter director of the Genesee Valley chapter of the New York Civil Liberties Union, the state affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union. And we are a co-sponsor of this program. Along with the Monroe County Bar Association, and the Roster Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. And we want to give a special thanks to Nixon Peabody for allowing us to use this beautiful space, which is much fancier than what I have access to in my nonprofit <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm Jeff Wadsworth. As Kaylin said, I'm president of the Rochester Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. And let me, uh, Scott's going to kind of lay down the background of the, of the case and the issues. And before we do that, let me uh, introduce our, our primary speakers, uh, Brett Harvey and Heather Weaver. Um, Brett Harvey has nearly two decades of experience litigating religious freedom in the public square. He has been with Alliance Defending Freedom and its headquarters in Scottsdale, Arizona since 2000, and he serves as senior counsel and leads the grants and funding team there. In 2010, Brett began overseeing litigation related to defending and protecting the time-honored practice of public invocations, that is, prayers offered before the public meetings of government bodies. And among other significant cases, he has been actively involved in the representation of the town of Greece in Town of Greece versus Galloway, which we're all here to hear about tonight. Mr. Harvey earned his JD in 1995 from the Walter F. George School of Law at Mercer University in Georgia, and his BS in political science from Liberty University in 1992. Heather L. Weaver is a senior staff attorney with the ACLU Program on Freedom of Religion and Belief. She litigates a wide range of religious liberty cases nationwide. She has served as counsel in a number of legal challenges to official governmental prayer, including legislative prayer. Heather is a graduate of Dickinson College and received her JD from the University of California, Berkeley at the Bolt Hall School of Law. Prior to joining the ACLU, Heather was an attorney at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, where she litigated cases involving a variety of church-state issues. So those are our esteemed speakers uh, this evening, and, and I think you're going to learn a lot from their... Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I prepared this uh, outline of pertinent facts, and everybody hopefully has a copy. Uh, if you don't, uh, they're right outside the door on the table. Uh, I would encourage folks to hang on to this. I'm not going to go through every point made in this outline. Uh, this outline is, derives, mo derives mostly from the opinion of the Second Circuit, uh, which, as you see at the bottom, uh, found the practice of the town uh, to be a violation of the Establishment Clause. Now, the practice we're talking about is the town board's uh, beginning of its meetings with prayer and whether the way it's constituted violates the Establishment Clause. And I'm giving you the Establishment Clause at the very bottom of the page. I would hope that everybody in this room, or majority, super majority of the people, know that those, those words by heart. Uh, but, uh, so I'm just gonna sort of pick out some of the pertinent facts. Uh, we do have some people maybe even more knowledgeable than me about what actually happened in the town of Greece during this period of time. Uh, they're in the room here. I will not identify them. Uh, but as you can see, this practice of prayer started in 1999 after uh, a practice of beginning board meetings with a moment of silence. Uh, there does not appear to be a formal policy or a formal policy was not promulgated by the board on the subject. It sort of just grow, arose a practice whereby a clerk maintained a list entitled Town Board Chaplain, uh, a list made up of clergy and maybe other notables of various religious congregations in the town. Uh, this, uh, these names were gleaned from the Community Guide, which is a Chamber of Commerce publication, and the town newspaper, the Greece Post. Uh, the a town clerk would call the persons on the list until uh, she or he found one who was willing to give a, the invocation for the town board meeting, and then that person would come and give the prayer. Uh, anybody uh, has or did have the right to give a prayer, and there was no request ever denied. 
uh, but this opportunity was now publicized. Uh, between 1999 and June of 2010, when the uh, case closed at the district court level, over, there were 130 prayers given. Uh, you, you see the identity of the prayer givers during that period of time. Um, everyone was a Christian minister, uh, with the exception of four in the year 2008. And those four uh, were either invited or volunteered as a result of uh, a complaint or, uh, made by the plaintiffs, ultimately. Uh, but uh, in 2009, uh, the town uh, went back to its practice of just in inviting Christian ministers. Uh, giving you the content of the prayer, as you can see, uh, two-thirds had some uh, faith-specific reference, one-third were generic, for lack of a better phrase. Um, I want to highlight, because the, the court did, said this, that there was no evidence that the town intentionally included representatives of particular faiths. Uh, Mr. Harvey, I'm sure, will be uh, emphasizing that. Uh, I've given you the history of the case. It started in 2008, uh, which is over five years ago, and now we are about to have argued before the Supreme Court uh, this case. And uh, both uh, Mr. Harvey and Ms. Weaver can explain uh, why it is significant legally, uh, but it does show you how long a case takes to reach the Supreme Court. Uh, so, without further ado, we'll try to go to our first uh, speaker, and that is Mr. Harvey. Um, we're doing that because uh, his firm will be the first to speak before the Supreme Court. So thank you very much. I appreciate everybody uh, coming out. I'm from Arizona, so this is a cold day, cold <laughs> night, but you braved the, uh, you braved the elements and, and you came out anyway, and I, I certainly appreciate that. Thank you for, for, for coming all the way up from D.C. To, to let us talk about this, Heather, and Scott, and Jeff, for inviting us. I, I certainly do appreciate it. Um, Alliance Defending Freedom has been involved in this case since it came up in 2008. In fact, uh, uh, I appreciate that Ray Dorado, the city attorney, is, is, is in the crowd tonight, and, and also John Jennings, who became aware of this case very early on and, and helped uh, facilitate uh, a connection uh, between Alliance Defending Freedom and, and the town of Greece, and it's been our privilege uh, to stand alongside the town as this case has gone on. We were thrilled when the uh, district court judge upheld the practice. We were disappointed when the Second Circuit uh, came to a, the opposite conclusion and decided that there was enough flux in the law, enough flux and what was going on with the law that we wanted to ask the Supreme Court to take a, a look and review the case, and they have agreed to do that. We will be arguing next Wednesday on November 6th, and then we would expect a decision to come down sometime in the spring, most likely, although it turns out Supreme Court judges don't uh, pay attention to our calendars, and they can issue an opinion anytime they want to between now and the end of June. Uh, so uh, that's kind of just a little bit of background of how, how we've been, how long we have been involved in the case. But a couple things I want to emphasize. One, what the town of Greece is doing, opening its town court meetings with a legislative prayer, is a time-honored tradition. It's a historic practice that predates the founding of America. In fact, the, Const the Continental Congress, before they, you know, they're convening about what do we do with Britain and are we going to write the Declaration of Independence and should we not? They open their meetings with a prayer. The Supreme Court noted that in, uh, uh, in the, the last time it look, looked at this case, uh, or looked at a similar case called Marsh versus Chambers. Um, the, the first Congress, uh, they, they opened their sessions with a prayer. Interestingly enough, another thing the Supreme Court noted last time it went up before them was that the members of the first Congress uh, voted to hire chaplains to deliver religious services which included opening each session with a prayer, three days before they finalized the wording of the First Amendment that they sent out to the states to ratify. And the court kind of looked at that and said, well, since they voted to hire paid chaplains to deliver prayers, then they drafted the wording of the Establishment Clause, and they maintained that practice for the next 225 years, 
we find it hard pressed to believe that they thought that they were doing something unconstitutional when they opened their meetings with a prayer. That made sense to me. Um, but it was just 30 years ago that the Supreme Court looked carefully at this historic practice in a case called Marsh versus Chambers. And I think in order to understand the context of what, what the court will be talking about next week, you need to understand the context of Marsh versus Chambers, because that's kind of the controlling case in this area. So what are the facts of Marsh versus Chambers? The facts are that they had a paid government employee, a chaplain, who was a Presbyterian minister. And they paid this guy, the same guy, to deliver prayers every morning of the, that the Nebraska legislature was open. And he did so for more than 16 years as of the time of the lawsuit. He kept going after the lawsuit was filed. But at the time the lawsuit came up, he had been doing this for 16 years. The same guy. And he was a Presbyterian minister. And uh, there is some uh, dispute as to uh, some of the nature of his prayers, how general they were, how specific they were. I can talk about that a little, a little bit later. But there was never a prayer that was a non-Christian prayer offered because a Presbyterian minister wouldn't do that. Uh, that would be rather counterintuitive for a Presbyterian minister to pray in a way that was contrary to, to his faith. Um, so the questions that came up then were, oh, and the court did note that the, that the for the 16 years leading up to the lawsuit, the prayers were often, I think they used the term, often explicitly Christian, which is what you would expect a Presbyterian minister to pray. Um, so there were several legal questions brought up in Marsh Fierce's chambers. First question was, can you have a prayer at all? What's the validity of, of having these prayers at a government meeting? The second question was, what's the validity of prayers that are frequently explicitly Christian and always in some sort of Judeo-Christian tradition? <coughs> what's the validity of the government paying for a chaplain? Uh, to, uh, a, a government employee acting uh, as a chaplain? And what's the validity of having the same person deliver prayers for 16 years? Because the prayers would have always had the same religious perspective. The court concluded that the history and ubiquity of legislative prayers make it clear that the authors of the Constitution did not believe legislative prayers were an establishment of religion. They noted when Congress voted and hired chaplains to perform their services. And they also noted that many congressional chaplains served for decades at a time. I mean, the original chaplain, I mean, they would serve for Decades. So the fact that it was the same guy didn't seem to be a problem for the founders. The fact that they paid a chaplain didn't seem to be a problem for the founders. And the fact that they prayed didn't seem to be a problem for the founders. And they're the ones who wrote the First Amendment. Um, so that kind of formed the basis of, 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 of much of the court's opinion. The court specifically rejected several arguments that were raised by Mr. Chambers, who was the legislator who had brought the lawsuit. Um, because he, he, he was upset that all the prayers were Christian prayers, or at least in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Congress, again, took a look at history, and they noted this one particular uh, uh, time in the congressional record where uh, the dispute was over who was going to be the chaplain, because there was enough uh, religious differences amongst the the members of Congress that they were like, well, I'm not sure I'm going to like the way he prays, you know? What if he, you know, delivers a prayer that's, that's outside of my faith tradition? What, what's going to happen then? And Sam Ad and the court in Marsh v. Chambers notes Sam Adams' response, in which, he's, in which he basically said, well, I'm no bigot, and I can listen to a prayer by a man of piety who is at the same time a friend of my country. You know, but he doesn't have, we don't have to have the same faith tradition if he's a friend of my country and a man of piety, I can listen to him pray. Uh, and that swayed the court. Um, so rather than, in, rather than engage in a debate about what the acceptable theology would be in a prayer, uh, the court stated that without evidence that the government has exploited the opportunity, the prayer opportunity, to proselytize or, or impermissibly advance or disparage another faith, judges should not evaluate the content of the prayers. Now, the First Amendment reads exactly the same today 
as it did in the 1700s, and it reads exactly the same today as it did in 1983, when the last time the Supreme Court looked at this case. Legislative prayers were not unconstitutional then, and quite frankly, I don't believe they're unconstitutional now. One of the questions that comes up in, in this case that has, that has come up is, is there a constitutional difference between prayers of Congress or prayers at the state legislature and prayers done at, at the town level? Is there a difference? Is there a reason to, to make them different? And I would submit to you that there is no constitutional difference between legislative events, whether they're at the state, federal, or the local level. Town meetings and public hearings are both governed by New York law. They're separate legal events. And even when, even when they happen to occur on the same night, the pledge and the prayer are offered at town meetings. Town meetings are intended by law to allow the public to observe the legislative, the le their elected officials perform the task of the government. And the reason they do this is the open meetings law. It's, it's a sunshine law. It's intended to, you have to allow the public to witness what's going on because if they don't like what you're doing, the next time a, a vote comes up, they can cast their vote, they can cast their ballot appropriately. It makes perfect sense. A town hearing is different. Town hearings are a quasi adjudicatory meeting. It occurs, it arises under a different state law. It uh, happens at a different noticed and public time. There is no indication at a town, at a, at a public hearing. Uh, they are legally distinct events, which is important because when you look at the, the paperwork filed by Americans United for the separation church and state in this case, they try to conflate the two and they try to suggest, oh, well, townspeople have to come to, to, to before the board for their zoning permits and for their building permits and, and you know, they have to come with their hat in their hand and, and, and subject themselves to these prayers in order to, in order to uh, participate in the town hearing. And that's simply not the case. It's not the case as a matter of law and it's not the case as a matter of the record of, of this case. Uh, as a matter of law, when people have, want to participate in a public hearing, they come at the time the public hearing is noticed, which is always at least 30 minutes after the town meeting uh, takes place, or at least 30 minutes after the town meeting begins and when the invocation is. And uh, people are free to come and go as, as they will. There is no legal difference between these legislative operations. The public is invited to observe and participate by invitation only at all levels of government during the legislative session. And members of the public, even children, are regularly recognized for their special achievements at all levels of government, whether it's Congress, the state, uh, you know, you win the Super Bowl, you get to go see the president, uh, you know, the Congress, uh, you know, regularly recognizes people for, the, for, for their civic achievements, just like happens at the state level and just like happens in the town of Greece. So what's this case really about, then? This case is about who decides how to pray. And I, and I want to kind of emphasize that for a moment, because that's, that's the crux of this matter. See, when, the paper, when, when Americans United for the Separation of Church and State filed their papers with the court, they conceded and they've admitted that, the, that prayers that open local legislative meetings are permissible. Okay? They don't, they don't violate the Establishment Clause. Well, if those prayers are permissible, and that's what the town's doing, the only question, the, the legal question remaining is, who gets to decide what to say in the prayer? And it focuses on whether or not the government has an obligation to censor these prayers, right? Can the government come and tell you, a member of the public comes up and volunteers, and offers a prayer, is it the town's job to come in and say, hey, you, we don't like the way you prayed, you need to be quiet, that's not what, that's not what we're, we're here about, you know, please don't do that, or is it the town to sit there and allow the public to come in and pray consistent with the dictates of their own particular conscience? Now, one of the facts, you know, that, that we talked about earlier is <coughs> how many of these people who offer prayers uh, at least self-identify it as a Christian background, and it's the majority. But I don't think there's anything pernicious in that. It happens to be the demographics of the community. If you were down in New York City, 
your, your demographic makeup would be different and probably the makeup, the content of the prayers would be different. But in the town of Greece, uh, you know, most often the people who are interested in, in volunteering to deliver the prayer happen to come from a Christian tradition and not surprisingly, they pray consistent with their own tradition. I wouldn't expect them to pray any, any other way. Um, and this gets me to one of, a question that I think we need to, to clear up and focus on real briefly. And that is because there's one label that confuses the debate here. And that's the label non-sectarian. Okay? You'll, you'll hear this a lot. You'll read the papers and they'll say, oh, well, we need to have non-sectarian prayers. Because non-sectarian prayers is a wonderful label that sounds very inclusive. And we like inclusivity. Inclusive is good, right? Uh, the problem is, it's a misleading label. And the parties don't even agree as to what it means. There's a traditional definition uh, that, that really talks about a subset of a particular faith, uh, kind of the difference between a, a, a Roman Catholic prayer and a, and a Baptist prayer. That's kind of the traditional understanding of non-sectarian. But that's not the way it's used in this most of the time. In this case, it's really meant to me, um, well, is it distinctly Christian or distinctly Islamic or distinctly Jewish? And they want to expand the, the label non-sectarian. Part of the challenge with using the label non-sectarian is, is kind of where it came from. In the 1800s, the term non-sectarian uh, came to vogue. And as the Supreme Court noted a few years ago in a case called Mitchell v. Helms, it came to vogue because it was code for anti-Catholic. Um, in, the, in the 1800s, there was a lot of, of, of anti-Catholic bigotry. There, was, there were these legislative amendments called Blaine Amendments where, where people were trying to ensure that no government funds would ever benefit anything that, that was Catholic. And so they created this term, you know, anti, you know non-sectarian. We want non-sectarian, you know. Can't, can't use government funds... Well, government funds can only be used for non-sectarian activities. Well, it was code for, for anti-Catholic. Uh, I think what a, a more accurate term and what more readily define, describes what we're doing is this is a question about can people pray consistent with their own unique faith? Or are they required to give some sort of generic prayer that, that some think is, is more appealing to a, to a broader cross-section of the community? Can the prayers be faith specific, or do they have to be generic? Some sort of, you know, they don't go quite this far, but, you know, I, and I don't know where a generic prayer is, because uh, everybody who prays is praying to somebody, some being, something. Otherwise, they're not praying. Uh, you know, nobody starts their prayer to whom it may concern. If you're out there and if you're interested, uh, you know, and if you intervene in the affairs of man, then, you know, feel free to, to bless us. That's not the way people pray. Uh, when people pray, they, they pray to, to something, some concept of God that is specific to them. And we believe the Constitution protects their right to do that. Um, you know, the Second Circuit kind of picked up on what the real complaint here was by... By, by the complainants. And the way the Second Circuit described it is, their complaint was that the prayers were not secular. I don't know what a secular prayer is. Uh, it, it's an appeal to what? Um, that, you know, that's not to say that, that, that people who don't have a faith or, or, or strictly secularist would not be invited to come in and, and say, you know, we... We wish nothing but, but wisdom and, and good fortune on, on the body. They're, they're welcome to do that. Uh, but I don't know if that's, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. If that, it's an invocation, but I don't know if it's a prayer. Um, because all prayers involve a particular concept of God. In 1992, the Supreme Court decided the case of Levi Weissman. This is a case that's going to be uh, debated significantly next week at the Supreme Court. Because in that case, although it arose in a unique context involving uh, 
prayer at a at a high school graduation that made the court nervous the court went out of its way that to know that the establishment clause does not permit the government to require generic prayers as a means of avoiding faith specific prayers the court reason that mandating some sort of generic prayer would have the effect of establishing a civic a civil religion which the court said the establishment clause prohibits and that rule is consistent with the court's demand in March v. Chambers that said you know what unless you have evidence that the government has exploited the prayer opportunity we are not going to look at the content of the prayers the legal arguments presented by those challenging the prayers I submit to you or will ultimately although they're they're couched in terms of inclusivity and diversity ultimately they will stifle religious freedom because the only way to enforce a generic prayer requirement is to censor the prayers the government has to be tasked with deciding what kind of prayers are acceptable and what kind of prayers are not and quite frankly I don't want the government making those choices whether it's the board members of the town of Greece or it's the Supreme Court of the United States if I'm going to deliver a prayer I have the liberty to pray consistent with the dictates of my own conscience and what this effectively does is it excludes then the devout there's a great number of people who believe that their faith tradition requires that when they pray they pray in a particular way you know and anyone who has that conviction need not apply if the if the law requires a generic prayer because we're not interested in your perspective we only are interested in those who don't have a problem with the generic prayer they're the favorite class those who want to pray a specific way need not apply and I think that's will be ultimately stifling to religious liberty the crux of the challenges argument is that they deserve the right to force the town to abandon a tradition that this that has existed in this country for centuries or take away the liberty of volunteer citizens to choose for themselves how they pray why do they want to be able to do that because they simply don't like to hear the way people choose to pray but the Constitution not only permits the town to acknowledge the faith of the community and open an opportunity for them to pray as they want but it also protects the liberties of the individuals to choose for themselves how to pray I appreciated your attention I'm sure you will hear a different perspective and look forward to answering your questions in a few minutes many of you know the ACLU has been the most prominent defender of free exercise rights for nearly a century now we represented members of the Jehovah Witness faith whose religious beliefs precluded them from reciting the Pledge of Allegiance at school or who were barred from spreading the word from door-to-door we represented Muslim women who were told that they could not wear a hijab in court we've challenged prison policies that deny religious diets to Jewish inmates and we represented countless Christians along the way including those who sought to preach the gospel or distribute religious literature on public streets and in public parks students who were told that they could not wear rosaries or crosses to schools and churches prohibited from ministering to and feeding the homeless but this case is not about the individual right to pray or preach the gospel it is about the right of the individual to be free from the government's official prayer or preaching it's about the right to participate freely in your local government without being treated like you're a second-class citizen just because of your religious beliefs and to illustrate this point I want to start out with a little exercise I want you all to imagine that you're at a meeting for your local town council you'll have five members of the town board sitting up front much like we are here at a table facing the audience there are far fewer people at this meeting than are in this room there's probably 10 people maybe 15 to 20 if there's a particularly controversial issue to be discussed that night after the meeting is called to order a board member announces that it's time for the invocation and introduces the prayer giver the prayer giver is going to be a member of the local clergy he walks up to the podium except for the podium isn't facing this way it's facing the board he will turn the podium around so we can all see the town seal and that clergy member will then ask the audience to stand and bow their heads so everyone around you will now be standing and bowing their head 
including the board members, as instructed. The prayer giver will start out by saying, let us pray. And the prayer might include a declaration that um, <clears throat> this is a Christian nation. It might criticize as ignorant anyone who believes otherwise. It will end with an explicit reference to Jesus, at least two-thirds of the time when you attend these meetings. And it might th the prayer giver might say, for example, Jesus Christ might pray in the name of Jesus Christ who took away the sins of the world, destroyed our death through his dying, and in his rising he has restored our life. After the prayer is concluded, the prayer giver will turn the podium back around to face the board. And a board member will thank the prayer giver for serving as the council's chaplain of the month. Now, I'd also like you to imagine that you are Jewish, Muslim, or Sikh, or any non-Christian faith, and attending this meeting because you would like to acquire a zoning variance for your home or business, or you'd like to address the board on an important local issue. Now, this is something new that I've, Brent's um, discussion of the difference between the public hearing and public board meeting is something new that I haven't heard before, but it's just semantics. These are all happening in the same meeting. They don't, the board doesn't start out its meeting and then adjourn and then start a new meeting for people who are applying for zoning variances or need or want to speak to the board for other reasons. <clears throat> if you want a zoning variance, you will show up at a meeting and you will be subject to prayer, period. So imagining yourself in this situation, I want you to ask yourself, would you feel comfortable taking part in an explicitly Christian prayer? Knowing that you have to appeal to the board in just a few minutes, would you feel comfortable remaining seated when everyone around you and the board members are standing and bowing their heads? Would you feel comfortable stepping outside of the room and trying to guess when you should re-enter, hoping that you don't miss the turn, your turn on the agenda? We believe that the First Amendment prohibits the government from forcing that choice on you or anyone who attends the meeting for any reason. Conditioning participation in a meeting of your local government on submitting yourself to prayer, especially the prayer of a specific faith, turns those of minority faiths and beliefs into second-class citizens, and no one should be treated like a second-class citizen because of her, his or her religious beliefs. Now, let's be frank. No governmental body should be opening its meetings with any prayer at all. It's so obviously unconstitutional that even prominent conservative, excuse me, even prominent conservative legal scholars like Michael McConnell, former 10th Circuit Justice, have said that the Supreme Court's decision in Marsh v. Chambers makes no sense and is unprincipled. Government-sponsored prayer burdens the right of individual conscience. It weakens religion by relying on the government to propagate it. And it causes religious divisiveness within communities. But even the court in Marsh thought that the exception that it created for legislative prayer could not include explicitly sectarian prayers. In fact, in Marsh, the court noted that by the time it heard the case, the chaplain of the Nebraska legislature had for three years been removing all explicit references to Christ. So the prayers were no longer Christian, explicitly Christian, and the court called them non-sectarian. Short of overturning the constitutional loophole authorized in Marsh, however, in the extremely narrow circumstance where legislative prayer is allowed, the government cannot and should not be permitted to dabble in religious preferentialism. And that's what the ACLU has argued in its front of the court brief that we submitted to the Supreme Court. Legislative invocations must be non-denominational so that they are as inclusive as possible and adhere as closely as possible to the Establishment Clause's demand that the government remain neutral among faiths in order to minimize its harms. Granted, a ban on sectarian legislative prayer would still leave many non-believers, polytheists, devout opponents of governmental appropriation of faith, etc., out in the cold. But the anything goes alternative offered up by the town of Greece and others is far worse. Now, the town and its supporters have raised a number of um, counter arguments and objections, and they've been many of them have been ably presented by Brett tonight. But no matter how ably these um, objections are presented, none of them in the end hold any water. The first thing that, they are, that uh, the town of Greece has argued, and many of its supporters, is that, and you've heard Brett say this, is that 
Legislative prayer is a time-honored tradition that dates back to the first Congress. Well, tradition should never trump constitutional principle. And relying on the actions of the first Congress as uh, evidence of how we should interpret the Constitution only makes sense if we assume that the, the first Congress and the members of that Congress were infallible. If we're going to rely on the actions of the Congress that passes laws as determinative evidence of how we should interpret the interpret these laws, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. For example, the 39th Congress, which ratified the 14th Amendment, one week after passing the 14th Amendment, which, remember, the 14th Amendment provides equal protection for people of all races, as well as other types of equal protection. But one week after passing that, ratifying the, thir the 14th Amendment, the 39th Congress also passed a law affirming the desegregation of Washington, D.C. public schools. So we should keep that in mind before we look back to the, the fact that the first Congress had legislative prayers as evidence that these prayers are constitutional. Next, the Pound says that the prayers are perfectly <coughs> permissible because they're not coercive and no one is forced to take part in them. And I think there are two points that have to be made in response to this. First, the situation I described in our little exercise earlier is what happens, it's what actually has happened at Greece meetings. Those are facts that are drawn from the record. And if you truly put yourself in the shoes of the Jewish or Muslim or Sikh attendee, it's just hard to imagine that anyone could deny that the prayer in this setting is coercive. If you can take that leap of empathy, you see immediately the dilemma that's faced by those of non-Christian faiths that attend these meetings. Second, even if participation in the prayers was, were purely voluntary, that doesn't mean that they're constitutional. The Establishment Clause has never meant that the government can affiliate itself with one faith so long as it doesn't force people to comply with its preferences. For example, even if you think it's perfectly okay and constitutional to stamp in God we trust on our money, you'd be hard-pressed to find many who think it would be okay if that were replaced with in Jesus Christ we trust. Next. The town and its supporters argue that because the prayer giver rotates among the local clergy and anyone can give a prayer, it does not favor any one faith. This is also deserving of several responses. First, it's just not true that the town has allowed anyone to give a prayer. With the exception of four prayer givers invited under threat of litigation, I might add, every single prayer giver over an 11-year period was a Christian clergy member. 11 years. No request was denied because nobody made a request before 2008. Why? Because they didn't know that they could. The town never advertised this so-called policy of allowing anybody to get up and give a prayer. <clears throat> it's a position that was adopted purely for litigation and nothing else. But second, even if it were true that anyone can give a prayer, it would be of little comfort to the Jewish or Muslim or Sikh zoning applicant that today's religiously coercive Christian prayer will be filed next month or two months from now by a religiously coercive prayer of some other faith. Just as it will be of little comfort to the Christian resident that this month's Muslim prayer, prayer will be followed by a Christian prayer next month. Take the example of Hartford, Connecticut. The city regularly opened its council meetings with explicitly Christian prayer delivered by Christian clergy for years, every single meeting. A few years ago, the council decided to invite local Islamic leaders to give prayers at a few meetings. Now granted, they would just be giving prayers at a couple of meetings and the prayer practice would probably return right back to the regular old Christian prayers thereafter. But the outcry and the hate mail received by the city caused the officials there to rescind the invitation. Third, as is the case in Greece, even if you rotate among local clergy, the fact is that minority faiths will be largely left out in the cold. In the 18 months before the record in Greece closed, 85% of prayers were explicitly Christian. So a Greece resident of minority faith would almost always encounter official Christian prayer at these meetings. Now, the town and, the support and its supporters throw their hands up in the air and say, what can we do? Most people here are Christians. But surrendering to religious demographics is no different than holding a vote on prayer. And the Supreme Court has already said that it's unconstitutional to hold a vote on prayer. And for good reason, because we don't put First Amendment rights to up for a vote in this country. Next, 
The town and its supporters say that the prayer is the private speech of the prayer giver and not attributable to the government. But the government can't get into the prayer business and then wash its hands of the content of the prayers. The prayers are authorized by the town and delivered on behalf of the town. There is a separate open public comment forum in meetings during which residents may speak out about whatever there is on their minds, but this is not it. This is not about the free exercise of rights of the invited prayer givers or the town council members. If local clergy want to stand outside of the town hall with a megaphone praying, or if council members want to gather privately to say a prayer beforehand, <clears throat> that's their choice, and the ACLU would be the first in line to defend that right. But the clergy here are not praying on behalf of themselves. They're praying on behalf of the government. There's different roles. They are standing in the government's shoes. And again, when the government gets into the business of prayer, it has to, in these limited circumstances where the court has allowed, ensure that the prayer is inclusive and non-denominational. Finally, the town and its supporters say it's impossible to tell what is sectarian and what is non-sectarian. But in practice, there have been few disputes about this. Town councils and state legislatures across the nation have implemented and successfully enforced policies that require non-denominational legislative prayers. Tellingly, even the towns that have lost in other legislative prayer cases and filed an amicus brief in support of the town of Greece have not claimed that they've had any actual difficulty in enforcing the court's order that their prayers remain non-sectarian. You know, it's not often that I quote Justice Scalia with approval. But on this issue, I think his words in his Lee v. Wiseman dissent are instructive. He said, quote, Our constitutional tradition from the Declaration of Independence and the first inaugural address of Washington down to the present day has, with a few aberrations, ruled out of order government-sponsored endorsement of religion, even when no legal coercion is present, where the endorsement is sectarian, in the sense of specifying details upon which men and women who believe in a benevolent, omnipotent creator and ruler of the world are known to defer, for example, the divinity of Christ, end quote. Justice Scalia seems to have no problem distinguishing sectarian references from non-sectarian ones, and it will be rare that town councils will have a problem as well. The alternative anything goes approach offered by the town would leave local governments powerless to step in no matter how rancorous, no matter how disparaging the official prayers might be. The result would strike at the very core of religious liberty and equality, divide our communities along religious lines, as we've seen as has occurred in the Greece case, and isolate those of minority faiths from basic democratic participation. The right thing to do here, and the constitutional thing to do here, is to limit legislative invocations, if allowed at all, to those that are non-denominational in nature. <clears throat>